All right. So hopefully you've enjoyed the session so far. That big panel with Bain and BlackRock um, is going to be followed now by some folks that you expect to see at SOCAP. You maybe expect to see a lot of places where you're looking at social change. Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, and the Gates Foundation have all been doing amazing work for years, and they've all redoubled their efforts around impact investing and understanding the power of using these markets for change. They're also re-understanding their role, and they're here to tell you a little bit more about that. So I'm welcoming Greg Ratliff from the Gates Foundation, Deborah Schwartz from the MacArthur Foundation, and Christine Looney from the Ford Foundation. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Greg Ratliff with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I'm here with Deborah Schwartz from the MacArthur Foundation, Christine Looney with the Ford Foundation. Uh, and we want to talk to you about impact investing and the history we've had. And this has been a great conference for me because I uh, ran the impact investment portfolio at MacArthur in the 90s and have been working in higher education for the last 10 years. So I'm sort of coming back in. And it's interesting to see a lot of things change. A lot of issues like exits stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought we might start off with some reflections from Christine uh, about the current state of the, of the field, where we are. You've just done, I know, a landscape analysis. So maybe tell us what you've learned. Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's great to be here. And I'm excited to see so many people in the room. I think you know, Ford started this market scan. But probably before I talk about that, it might be good to give some history and context for our involvement in the market, which started really in the late 60s when we um, started making PRIs, um, worked with the IRS to allow private foundations to make them. And since then, we've had almost 50 years of investment experience, um, which in and of itself has given us a lot of lessons and practical, practical experiences in the field. But I think as importantly, when I think in being on a, on a panel with, with Deborah, especially, who's been such a partner to Ford in all of our work over the years, it's important to kind of reflect on what what some of our most important or most uh, meaningful investments have taken to kind of get to the stage they're at today. And if I reflect on markets like the community development finance market in the United States or the microfinance market overseas, Ford and MacArthur and others were early, early stage investors in these, in these organizations. And it, it wasn't just the investment capital, though, that made these, this field grow to where it was today. It was a combination of investments plus grants um, a lot of support to things like trade associations and ratings agencies and um, measurement tools and just even capacity building for these institutions. And so if you look at the self-helps, for one example, who started small and is now almost a billion dollar organization, two, two billion dollar organization, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's important to kind of look at, to see kind of what it took to get them there. Um, we. We found ourselves, you know, about a year and a half ago under with a new president, Darren Walker, and we were looking at the growth of this space and looking at the role that we had in it. And we'd been investing at that, at that point really to support our own programs. Um, we'd been doing some grants, but once again, to really support our own programmatic initiatives. And um, we were kind of reflecting on the amazing growth that was taking on in the impact investing market, the number of new investors, and, and kind of stepped back and said, well, what role should philanthropy be playing in this? And is there a role for Ford within this? And so we engaged Monitor Deloitte to really help us do a scan of the market, to really just kind of level set where we thought the market was at. And I think for, for those of you who are you know, practitioners in this space, what we found won't be alarming to you. It was, um, I mean, one thing that came out was that there was a lot of hype in the market, um, that this was the solution for all solutions and that everyone can make you know, tons of money and deliver the impact. Um, I think there was a level of huge investor appetite, um, but maybe a lot more work needs to be done in terms of investor preparedness. On the demand side, we saw just a huge growth in the sophistication of the types of, of products and organizations and funds that were emerging, um, but a continued need for more organization to help investors not only find them or them to find investors for general marketing and communications of, of those products. And then in the middle, um, 
some very nascent and emerging market infrastructure, but that needed to be developed further to help connect those two. And I think Deborah will really speak to that. Um, and that, so that was kind of our, the first stage of, of almost our, our level setting in the market. And, and the second was really a dive into, well, you know, Ford could enter this, but in and of itself, we could do little. So what would it look like if we took a collaborative approach to this work? And so I'd say the next phase of this for us has really been speaking with so many of you to see where there are opportunities for mm -hmm. collaboration um, and um, to develop kind of partners um, for us as we kind of start mm -hmm. this initiative. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's great. Deborah, do you have anything further to add yeah. in terms of the state of the field? Thanks, and, and I would just build off what Christine says that I think um, Ford and MacArthur and Packard and, and many others, uh, you know, have been at this for a long time, uh, but I think that was for a set of challenges and enterprises that don't look like the full scope of the social sector today. You know, we have a much wider spectrum of everything from pure nonprofits that are looking to build what the Heron Foundation calls philanthropic equity, uh, to hybrid models, and we've worked a lot in the affordable housing space with joint ventures and LLCs. There's, there's all of those kinds of things to public-private partnerships, special purpose vehicles. So what's really wonderful, right, is there's this incredible spectrum in the social sector, and now there's also this incredible spectrum of investors. Right, everything from the mainstream investors we just heard from, uh, the Black Rocks and Bain and others, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, and it's a long list, a whole uh, emerging class of specialty advisors and also mainstream advisors who are building mission into their practice, high net worth individuals, and then retail investors, and you heard from Calvert, which has been in that retail end of the spectrum, um, as well as an incredible array of foundations and the Mission Investors Exchange, with which Christine and I were part of when it first began 12 some odd years ago, has 250 foundations. The Global Impact Investors Network, Global uh, Confluence Philanthropy, US CIF. So there is an incredible, uh, wonderful, vibrant community. But to Christine's point, the next challenge is really how do we as foundations that have significant <laughs> capital to put to work, and we have 300 million dedicated 100% to impact. Uh, we also have a 30-year track record, so not quite as long, uh, but we've deployed about a half a billion dollars, and we've learned a lot, as Christine said. And so I think the next generation of our work is how to bring those assets, our risk tolerance, our capacity to do dogged problem solving, mm and how to take all of that as well as the kind of ingenuity that it's taken to really build up individual sectors and individual enterprises, and how do we help build a marketplace that really, uh, in a fluid and meaningful way, connects the flow of capital, making it easier um, for those who are trying to raise the capital to get it on the terms that really work, capital that's suitable, not just capital, the capital that's suitable, how do we make it easier and more suitable for investors of all kinds to play together? And I think, I'll just leave it with saying, you know, the G8 task force report last year, the global task force talked about this next generation being about risk, return, and impact. I would say that the work that our foundations and others have done for the last 30 to 50 years has been all about creatively applying tools of various kinds to meld risk, return, and impact. Our next generation of work needs to really be about ease, suitability, liquidity, because we've got to get to a much more efficient ecosystem so entrepreneurs don't end up struggling so hard and so long uh, to cobble together the resources they need for the invention and innovation work, for the growth and scale, and for their long-term success. Um, it's just too hard too slow. Yeah. No, that's really great. <clears throat> so you guys talk a lot about the proliferation of, of actors and players in the space, the kinds of transactions that are being done. I mean, it's a really dynamic time. And I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned risk. What are the challenges in that new space? You've got all these new people coming in. They're, they're trying to figure out how to work together. What are the issues you're most concerned about as you move forward? Maybe I'll start. And, um, 
So I, I think for me, there, there are a couple. I, I think one is with new entrants and new energy, um, people may be starting to almost recreate the wheel when others have been kind of working on things for quite a long time and yeah. it's out there, but we just haven't done a good enough job marketing um, some of this. And so or, people are, or even or sharing, sharing the models. It. Yeah. Um, the second, it, it's come up quite a bit, but is this kind of fear of greenwashing, that we have new investors coming in who are almost selling their products with impact as a selling point, um, but maybe it's not as um, front and center to what they actually really want to do. And so are we, are we um, is this market in, in jeopardy of that? And maybe the third is maybe around just overall complexity. It's complexity of, of language and the perpetuation of that, how many different ways we're kind of all describing what we're doing. Um, I think it makes it pretty confusing um, for, for new entrants coming in the space. And, the, and then the second is this complexity of, of product development. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've worked on many transactions together where we're you know, one of up to 20 investors, all with very boutique interests in, in transactions. And it's costly and time consuming. Yeah. And I'm not even sure at the end of the day, we're all even extremely satisfied right. with where we got. So we need, we need to really simplify um, not only the language, but the, the products we're putting out there to make it easier for capital to flow more effectively. Yeah. I mean, when we think about the global kind of risks within the marketplace, I, I agree. I think there are, there's a very healthy discussion at this venue and others about this issue of quote unquote impact or good washing. Um, I would put it a little differently. I think that, that we have to be honest that not all kinds of capital are going to be right for certain kinds of problems and that when you're looking at certain kinds of enterprises really honing in on sort of deep, challenging social environmental issues, enterprises that may be very untested, uh, very innovative, un unusual markets, um, the, the truth is we need to be very actively making the capital work for them. And that's what I would call sort of deep impact. You know, it's, it's not just enough to have money and motivation. You actually have to be prepared to look at how to blend the public, the private, the philanthropic capital and make the solution work. Um, those kinds of investments, I've often said, are not just made, they're not, they're not just lying around. You know, they're made, not found. The problem I see is that as large flows of capital come into the space, if we don't build some products, to Christine's point, that make the connection, I think it's unreasonable to expect that the large deployment of capital is going to be able to do that artisanal finance, right? Um, and so I think we'll get a lot of shallow impact, which will be okay. It'll be good. It'll be better than it is today. But it may leave out the ability to really mm -hmm. continue scaling things that, that are incredibly valuable to, to solving some of the biggest problems in our world. And so right. our challenge is how to go to deep impact and not just shallow impact. And I think that's one. The other is sort of the shadow of subprime and also some things that happened in the microcredit world. I think when investors' expectations are inflated or hyped, mm -hmm and you get a lot of money rushing in, you get very smart people who say, there's money for me to make if I wrap myself in the impact mantle. And so there is a job for foundations, I think, but for all of us to be good stewards of mission. And that's never going to be cut and dried. Right. No, those are great, great comments. Thank you, guys. So let's get to the good stuff. So, you know, you mentioned, Deborah, your 300 million compared to the 75 trillion uh, of the mainstream investors, right? And so increasingly foundations are a smaller part of the capital in the mm -hmm. impact investing yeah. space. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you see your role shifting and how it needs to shift, and then maybe transition into, based on, the, on your sense of the landscape, what are the specific things you're plan, planning to do going yeah. forward? What kinds of projects? How are you gonna position yourself? How are you gonna collaborate? Well, again, I want to echo what Christine said. I, I think that, you know, we're just like Ford, very mindful. And we started about two years ago looking at this exact question around the same time that Christine and Darren and Frank and, and Zav, other colleagues at Ford, were looking at this because we're mindful of this incredible opportunity, right? More capital than ever, wanting to find ways to, to be meaningful. Um, and... You know, we've, we've learned how to knit together the deals that, that unlock 
impact on a transaction by transaction by transaction basis, and that's powerful, right? I mean, we have 15 years of working on one issue alone, rental housing in the United States, and our $200 million investment in that field, building up a set of enterprises and intermediaries, has unlocked $15 billion in new capital, and hundreds of thousands of lives and homes have been transformed, and that's great. But we can't be the only source of that $200 million. Ford can't be the only source of the capital it's provided to microcredit. So one of the first steps is the collaboration, and, and Darren Walker convened a set of presidents from foundations that make impact investments uh, earlier this year, and that's an ongoing conversation, and I think that's an important part of the future for all of us is that the institutions themselves that have the most flexibility, that have the greatest ability to take risk and innovate, that we work together to create a real community uh, of support that fosters innovation and a next generation of marketplace um, capacity. So a couple specific examples would be the new products that Jen just an announced um, so in addition to Raices, uh, a fund called Age Strong, another one that she announced with uh, President Obama around in investment in India, MacArthur was able to provide a modest amount of grant support, but it helped them do the legal and technical work involved in a new structure. Another uh, is Impact US, uh, it's, or Impact Us, excuse me, Liz, and both Ford and MacArthur. Uh, have provided seed capital to build a new online marketplace. And Liz will be talking, she's somewhere in the room, I think, at 12.15 today, she'll be talking about that. Another, to the point that Christine made, is documenting what we already know about creative solutions. And Bruce Campbell will be talking about the Innovative Term Sheet Project, which Ford and Heron and Piton and Sorensen and Blue Haven have all funded. Because we can provide a library, a playbook, and people, both entrepreneurs and investors, will not be stuck having to figure this all out from scratch. So those are just some examples. Mm -hmm. I have one more, but why don't we shift over to Christine? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think to your first point in terms of the role of philanthropy, this was a, a question that came out in our market scan. And I think resoundingly, whoever we interviewed um, kind of voiced that there is a big role for philanthropy to play in this growing market. And I think. For foundations, it's kind of looking at all the resources we have available to contribute. And they're beyond, I mean, grants are an important piece, the investment capital and our ability to be flexible with that and as catalytic as possible in terms of supporting growth in the market will be really important. There are also things like convening power. There are things like um, the leadership um, that these foundation presidents can bring to the conversation, both in terms of really bringing home this notion of impact and, and being a standard for a good practice in, in the market. So I think there, there are many, many opportunities in terms of philanthropy's ability to engage. For Ford, um, going forward, I, I think for us, we're, we're looking at something that will be almost a, a, a three-part strategy that will include a grant component as part of a new impact investing initiative that will be very market-facing. I mean, I, I think to Deborah's point, we're going to try to support as many things as we can that will be catalytic to the market and better connect the investors and, and um, the demand side. Um, we will be engaging quite a bit in terms of supporting um, public policy. And um, I think we've had an important win with the recent Treasury guidance. There's a lot of positive moment, momentum around ERISA, um, but bringing, I think, alongside these movements in public policy, the, the really necessary communications and education um, that will really make these policies not just move forward, but actually effective and um, so that we can implement them and actually have more capital flow to the issues we care about. And the third will be within our own investment fund strategy. And there, I think for Ford, we're really looking at how we can engage in markets and make markets more effective um, versus looking at particular transactions and, and individual investments. So the more effective we can be at that in being a real catalyst and being flexible, um, I think the better and more of a contribution we'll be able to make to the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Barbara? Yeah, so I, echoing Christine, I think we're going to be putting grant dollars to work to help 
share innovations that exist, new ones that are coming uh, into being, um, and be a resource in that way to help, again, foster kind of a community of collaboration and product innovation and market building. Um, I think it is important to recognize that matchmaking in this world is important, right? And there's some really exciting platforms emerging. But matchmaking itself, the matching, is not going to be sufficient that if we really want to connect the supply and the demand sides of this marketplace, we actually need to do true market making. And that means putting our capital at risk and finding others who are willing to put capital at risk in a completely different way. So I'll give you an example of a product innovation because I think we are not going to get to a liquid, suitable set of products that really allow large flows of capital to come into the deep end of the pool if we don't actually make that happen. So, for example, this summer we completed a transaction where the foundation, instead of just providing risk mitigation, you know, we've, we've done that for many, many years, where we will provide just enough first loss or guarantee protection, you know, to help an investor say, okay, it's a little bit unusual or I'm a little bit uncomfortable, but now I'm okay, or to basically get the risk return equation to work. In this transaction, we did something called a liquidity facility. And for those of you who don't come out of investment banking, that is not a liquidity facility is not a glass of wine. Um, it is not a room in your house um, or the kitchen sink. A liquidity facility is a way of standing behind an investment and saying, when you investor are ready to exit, we over here, the market maker, will buy you out. And we will buy you out and take the risk that nobody will ever want that security. And then hopefully what we will actually do is be able to then be the bridge to the next investor. And the reason we did this, it was a large social enterprise that had hit what we all know as the valley of death. We had helped launch it together with Ford two years before. It had scaled up to a certain point but the equity that it had wasn't sufficient to get to the next level of growth. And it needed to get to that next level to start to really tap in to more mainstream investors. So here's this classic gap. And what we were able to do is to bring two financial institutions to the table who really didn't want to do equity, that was not their thing, and they really didn't like the idea that this was an investment that had a 10-year horizon and actually no real mechanism for exit. This was not a fund, and the equity does not have a life on it. Mm. it the, it's indefinite life. So we provided a 25% promise that a quarter of that equity would be something we would be willing at MacArthur to buy mm. at a later date. That's and it worked. So that's just an example mm -hmm. of what we mean by trying to actually inject liquidity to this next stage mm -hmm. of the market, and we have other projects underway, and we really look forward uh, to conversations because we think there are ways to engineer new models. So I'm wondering if you guys, to the degree you're willing to name names, could say a little more about the kinds of financial institutions and partners you think you need to sort of realize this vision. Because Listening to you, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate, I hear you meeting with each other, foundations and foundations talking. And to pull this off, that can't be the case. Yeah. And so how do you include more mainstream financial yeah. actors in the dialogue and the structuring and design? Well, I'll just tell you. I mean, we have five or six big projects underway. We're talking to investment banks, to family offices, to RIAs, you know, and that's one of the things that's so exciting for us is that the real explosion of interest in impact investing means that we have a much wider array of potential partners. But at the end of the day, there are a set of players, and big foundations are among them, who bring important kinds of resources into the mix. So we are, I think, necessary, but not going to be sufficient. Mm -hmm. And to use Christine's word, we need to catalyze this community of market building. It'll not be any one of us cannot do this. We need talent and expertise, traditional capital markets, tools and expertise, all of that's going to be required. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I would, I would completely agree. I, I think just partnering with foundations would have been the easier play. Um, but as you said, we're such a small percentage of this market. And so, like Deborah, I mean, we're in our conversations, they've expanded much, you know, well beyond philanthropy. Um, we're, we've really been attempting to be strategic in terms of where are the big pots of capital and what, what will it really take over time to unlock that. And so having conversations with like CIO investor roundtables and people like that who- and donor advice funds would be another funds example. And donor advice funds and government, importantly, yeah. as yeah. a huge kind of catalyst um, yeah. beyond philanthropy in, in this market. And so I think it's gonna take all, uh, many, many different um, yeah. types of institutions to kind of make this um, as effective as we'd like it to be. So we're open to those partnerships. That's great. Well, we are out of time, so we'll have to come back next year to hear how it all goes. Exactly. But please join me Thank in thanking you. our panelists. <laughs>